Hi everyone. Welcome to workshop three of the Planted Goodness workshops. Today we're going to be talking about water pollution, which is one of the effects of livestock on the environment. And we're also going to be pairing that with how regenerative agriculture uses livestock on their farms sustainably, which is super important because it shows us how, again, eating meat is okay. We just have to reduce our intake of meat in order for the environment to sustain the amount of meat we eat. So let's first talk about water and animals. We're going to talk about how livestock relates to water usage and pollution. So let's talk about where the world's water usage goes to. 4% of the world's water comes from the home. This means the showers, bath, laundry, and dishwashing you do, or whatever other, maybe water in your plants, whatever other water you use at home. So that seems awfully low for the amount of long showers and baths and amount of like dirty dishes we have. Only 4% of the world's water goes towards all of that. So where does the other water go? Well, 27% of the world's water is used to produce animal foods. That means way more water is used to produce foods for the livestock than we use in our home. And this is not even taking it into account the water that is used to actually give to the livestock to drink. This is just to produce the food they eat. And they eat a lot of food, so it takes a lot of water. Just for, for, for perspective, in California, you can save more water by not choosing to eat one pound of meat than by not showering for six months. That's a long time to go without showering. So please shower, but maybe try to skip a pound of meat one time and you'll save just as much, if not more water. So here's a little infographic of the amount of water consumed per pound of retail food that's purchased. As you can see, butter takes up 2,057 gallons of water per pound, and hamburger beef takes up even more, 2,463 gallons of water per pound of hamburger beef. Now, if you think of that, a typical burger is usually a quarter pound, like a quarter pounder. So that would take up about 600 gallons of water to produce the beef needed for your patty in your burger. If you look at some of the other things on here, there's pork, eggs, cheese, and chicken, and they all take up a really good amount of water. But then you see all the plant-based foods, like I think there's cantaloupe or melon down there, which takes a 40 gallons of water and tomatoes take up 29, lettuce takes up 21. So you see that the plant-based foods really conserve a lot more water than the animal-based foods. So water pollution. One of the biggest contributors to water pollution is livestock. Um, the pollutants that come from livestock include their waste, the antibiotics or the medicine used to treat the illnesses that come across the livestock, the hormones used to make them bigger, fertilizers to make their feed crops grow faster and bigger, pesticides for the feed crops as well, and eroded or degraded soil. Livestock produce uh, about 50 tons more waste each year than humans. That is a lot more waste, and we the environment cannot just sustain that vast amount of waste. So where does it go? It goes into our water streams. It pollutes a lot of other areas, but our water is one of the most affected areas by this excess waste. About 40% of the rivers and streams in the U.S. are impaired by pollution, and the leading cause of pollution is agriculture, and more specifically, animal agriculture plays a huge role in this percentage of water pollution. So let's talk about manure or waste. Hogs produce about two to four times as much waste as the average human. And these are hogs. They're not even cattle yet. By the mid 1990s, hogs in North Carolina generated as much waste as the humans in North Carolina, California, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, and North Dakota combined. Wow. And if you look at this list, California and New York are densely, and Texas, are super densely populated areas. So 
hogs in North in just North Carolina alone produce more waste than all of those humans in those areas combined. So the volume of waste of these industrial animal farms is way too much to put back into the fields as fertilizer. Because as we talked about before, you can use the waste of livestock as fertilizer. That's actually what goes into a lot of natural fertilizers. But this is just way too much waste and our farms can't handle that. Livestock in the US produces 500 million tons of waste per year. That's a lot of waste. So where does it go? It usually goes into lagoons or cesspits. Industrial animal farms store the manure mixed with water in these. The cesspits are gigantic and store millions of gallons of animal waste. And it breaks down into methane, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases, um, which contribute to global warming and heat up our earth. The methane and carbon dioxide don't mix well with the water in the cesspits, so they're actually released into the atmosphere. And that is really what contributes to the global warming that we are experiencing right now. Let's talk about fertilizer. Fertilizer provides nutrients to plants. Plants need nutrients to survive. Most fertilizers are made of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium because these are the nutrients that plants consume in large amounts. When soil is degraded, usually from monocropped farms that are used to produce like livestock feed because they only grow corn and soy, it starts lacking nutrients and that's when farmers have to use fertilizers because farmers end up using fertilizers to replace the nutrients that the soil cannot get naturally because they only grow these one crop. Think of soil, or think of fertilizers as medicine for the soil. If you're sick or you have a cold or a fever, it's, it's okay to use medicine because it can sometimes help you get better quicker and it'll make you feel better faster. But if you use medicine too often and start using it just when you're okay, when you're healthy, it'll actually weaken your immune system because your immune system won't be able to fight off the diseases as well. Similarly, fertilizer, when used in large quantities, is way too much for the soil to handle and it will actually make the soil unhealthy because the soil will start to rely on the fertilizer for nutrients and it won't um, get its nutrients from natural sources. So there are some major problems with fertilizer. First, it pollutes the water because industrial farmers usually put a lot of fertilizer and the plant just can't absorb that many nutrients. So the um, excess ends up running off into local water sources and pollutes them. It also degrades land as we just talked about because they boost crop yields in the short run, but they actually degrade soil because it becomes unhealthy and starts to rely on the fertilizers. It also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions because the production of fertilizers go through factories and they emit a lot of greenhouse gases, as well as they're very expensive. Farmers who rely on fertilizers spend tons of money every year buying fertilizers for their crops because their crops rely on fertilizers because their soil is no longer healthy. A fertilizer runoff creates something known as algae blooms, which are the result of phosphorus and nitrogen in the water sources. It covers the river with a layer of green uh, algae, which blocks the sunlight and oxygen, and it kills plants and animals. The algae and seagrass eventually decay, the green stuff on top, which uses lots of oxygen when they're decaying. And when they use lots of oxygen, they suck up all the oxygen from the water, which ends up killing all the other good creatures in the water, like crabs and fish and oysters. Other things that are carried in runoff are antibiotics and hormones. Antibiotics treat sickness in the livestock and hormones speed up the growth of the cattle. When antibiotics and hormones get into water sources, they can affect the reproduction of some fish and even kill them. It also can contain some traces of diseases from the livestock. Regenerative agriculture, as we have talked about, preaches uh, using nature and being guided by nature. And part of nature is livestock. Livestock is natural, just not in the amounts that we produce it today. 
So today we're going to talk about how regenerative agriculture uses livestock on their farms to benefit the soil. Livestock is a crucial part of nature and many ecosystems. It just must be used sustainably. Let's talk about including meat in our diets. I know I've said this a lot, but I really just want to reinforce this point. We can do it because meat is an important part of nature's balance. Eating meat is also part of the balance. Reducing our intake is just as important though, because although we can still eat meat and animal products, we should think about reducing our intake of it or eating less of it because nature cannot sustain the amount of meat we consume. So instead of eating meat two or three times a day, maybe try to first start off by eating it once a day and then maybe eating it a few times a week. And it'll help with the sustainability of the meat. Using livestock is an important part of regenerative agriculture because it helps naturally fertilize and cultivate the crop growth as long as we reduce our intake and allow the farms to just produce the amount of livestock that nature can handle on its own. So historically, livestock have played an important role in farms. They've provided friendship, they enrich soils with their manure, they also provide the muscle for farm work because they're very strong. They are a source of protein and they can boost plant growth because their hooves trample over the grass. However, modern production practices create an unsustainable relationship between us and the livestock. Let's go back to the hogs and see how its livestock farming has kind of evolved over time. Beginning in the 1900s, a hog farm typically had 100 to 200 hogs, which seems pretty reasonable. They were raised on a pasture, which means a large, flat grassland, so they had lots of space to roam, and grain was just used as a supplement. However, 100 years later, in the beginning of the 2000s, two-thirds of U.S. facilities have at least 2,000 hogs living in them. That's over 10 times the amount of hogs they had in the 1900s. Almost all of these hogs are raised in confinement, so they no longer get to go and eat on the pasture. They have to stay in their stalls. And most livestock is fed corn and soy, or grain and soy, and they're raised on factory farms. So regenerative agriculture says no to this. We're going to do something different. So they use livestock to improve the soil quality, trap carbon within the soil, and increase the organic matter of the soil. Livestock can be used to trample on plants and soil through grazing management. Grazing is basically just when livestock are allowed to consume wild plants outdoors, such as grass. In feedlots, they're not allowed to graze because they're kept in their stalls and they're just fed grain to them. They aren't allowed to kind of go roam around and find their own food. But grazing management is what um, regenerative agriculture does, and it allows farmer to control where and for how long the animals graze. So it's beneficial to both the animals and the crops. Instead of feeding cows grains, they just let the cows eat the stubble of crops, which are the remains after they harvest the crops. This makes everybody happy. The cows are happy because they weren't meant to eat grain. It makes them sick. So now they get to roam around and eat their favorite food. Farmers are happy because it's less work for them. They don't have to fertilize and it's also less money because they don't have to buy fertilizer. And the soil is happy because it is fertilized by the manure of the cows and cows push the crop remains into the soil, which increases its organic matter. And finally, the microorganisms in the soil are stimulated because the animals eat the plants. Then the plants have to repair themselves because the animals tear at the plants. And so the microorganisms provide the nutrients for the plants to repair themselves which leads to carbon sequestration, which we're going to talk about. That's a big word, but we're going to break it down. So let's talk about microorganisms. There's more to some soil than you may think. It's not just dirt. Soil is alive. Want to know something really cool? Healthy soil can actually help stop climate change. Yes, that's right. Plants can take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the healthy soil. This is what's known as carbon sequestration. So they take the carbon out of the atmosphere, 
and they push it through their roots into the soil. We breathe out carbon dioxide, they breathe in carbon dioxide, and they push the carbon into the soil, taking it out of the atmosphere. So here's a short video about what carbon sequestration is. It's really cute and I think it's really informative. Do you feel hopeless about climate change and the damage we are doing to our planet? I did. But then I was shown a new way to look at the problem, which made the solution so obvious and so within reach. A solution that's right under our feet. Climate change is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon's not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it. It's us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools of where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil fuel. Then we burned it for energy, putting it into play, disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon from the soil and biosphere into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. Now the oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon which is resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course, we have to stop releasing fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get this cycle back into balance? Well, remember when I said that the solution is right under our feet? It literally is. It's the soil. Plants with sunlight and water perform photosynthesis. They pull in carbon from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of those sugars down through their roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build soil. Voila, carbon move. Plants pump it in and soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost sets up an ongoing positive feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. In concert with other regenerative practices like not killing the soil, planting trees, cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain gigatons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture, and there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich, full of life, and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone that eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into the atmosphere or it pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video, and we're going to now talk about a little bit more of what they discussed in that video. With an activity, we're going to learn more about healthy soil and what makes it, and the different organisms and microorganisms that are in the soil by making a yummy snack. So grab your ingredients and let's get started. You can pause the video anytime you need during this activity because I'm going to go through it again pretty fast. So if you need more time to build your worms and dirt or decomposers in soil, just make sure you pause the video. 
So our soil for this activity is going to be the chocolate pudding. What do you think is in soil? What makes soil healthy or unhealthy? Do you think darker soil or lighter soil is better? I want you to think about these three questions right now and throughout this activity because hopefully they become more clear as we move through this activity. Soil has many things in it, including rocks, minerals, water, and air. Rich, healthy soil also contains a lot of organic matter. Now that might be a new term for you, but organic matter is pretty simple. It just refers to all the things living and dead in the soil, some of which is part of the decomposition process, which is just how things break down in the soil. Soil holds the roots of plants, which allow the plants to grow. There are many important decomposers and microorganisms living in the soil, which create a microscopic living community underground, which is what makes the soil healthy. And these are all the things that you'll see we're gonna be putting into your chocolate pudding today. So hopefully after this activity, you realize that soil is not just the chocolate pudding. It's not just dirt. It's full of life. It has so many other things in it that help create a healthy soil and create relationships all beneath your feet. And it's just amazing what they can do. And as they mentioned in the video, all of these relationships can help pull carbon out of the atmosphere and help the plants push that carbon into the soil because the microorganisms eat the carbon exudates, which is what the plants push out from the, their roots. So a decomposer is just an organism that decomposes some organic material. A decomposer is, is a broad term and a microorganism is a more specific term for a decomposer, which is microscopic. So you can't see any microorganisms, but you can sometimes see decomposers. Let's investigate what these are. Earthworms. So earthworms are your first decomposers. We're going to be using gummy worms to represent our earthworms today in our soil. So go ahead and put some earthworms or gummy worms into your soil right now while we talk more about what they do. So earthworms are decomposers. That many of them move around by eating the soil that's in front of them, passing it through their bodies, and out on the other side. Earthworms get the food they need by eating the dead organic material in the soil, then releasing the nutrients. They only eat dead plants and animals and break it in, down into smaller parts. So they don't necessarily do like anything chemical with it. They just kind of, they're like our teeth. They just chomp the food down into smaller parts so the microorganisms can further decompose it later. Once the earthworms eat their food throughout the soil and break the organic material down, the microorganisms come in to help. Earthworms are big decomposers. Obviously, we can see earthworms, so they're not microorganisms. They physically break down the material, as we said earlier, and the microorganisms will come in to help later and they will chemically break it down. So think of it as, we said, your mouth and the earthworms are kind of like your teeth. So they chomp down on all of the big things into smaller materials. And then the microorganisms are kind of the chemicals in our mouths or like our saliva, which breaks down the food chemically. So our first microorganism is going to be bacteria. I know a lot of people think bacteria, ah, like it's bad. And there is bad bacteria, which can make you sick, but there's also good bacteria. Bacteria is all around us. And we're talking about the good bacteria here in the soil. And marshmallows are going to represent that bacteria for us. So bacteria is actually crucial to healthy soils because they help in the final stage of breaking down the organic material and turning it into the rich nutrients, which the plant can absorb. They're super tiny. There's anywhere from 100 million to 1 billion bacteria in just one tiny teaspoon of moist soil. So bacteria are single-celled organisms. That's getting a little bit more into the details, but they're also decomposers. They're decomposers that we can't see. They eat the dead plant material and release the nutrients from this. It's so important that we have bacteria because if they didn't do this, other plants and animals 
wouldn't be able to access the nutrients in the soil from the organic material. Bacteria changes the nutrients from inaccessible forms to usable forms. Um, now, another microorganism that we're going to talk about is fungi, and more specifically, mycorrhizal fungi, which is going to be represented by the M&Ms. So these fungi live near the roots of the plants and provide the plants with nutrients. Mycorrhizal fungi may seem like a big word and it's big and scary, but it actually has a super important relationship with the plants and helps create super healthy soil. Mycorrhizal fungi help break down the organic matter into nutrients that the plants can use, similar to the bacteria. They have a symbiotic relationship, the mycorrhizal fungi and the soil, which just means that both sides benefit. So the plant root feeds the fungi carbon-rich proteins and sugars and also dead root cells. So that's how the mycorrhizal fungi benefit. The plant roots benefit because the mycorrhizal fungi release nutrients in plant available forms to the plant root and help the roots intake water. So they both benefit on this side of the relationship. The mycorrhizal fungi are fed and the plant roots are given nutrients. However, there's a broken relationship here when fertilizer is used. In a relationship, in any relationship, a friendship, maybe your mom or dad, or even with the soil, two people or things need to participate. You can't just, you can't hug somebody without somebody to hug. You both have to hug each other. So similarly, fertilizer breaks this relationship between the fungi and the soil because it artificially provides the plants with nutrients. With fertilizer, plants no longer need the fungi because remember how we said the fungi give the plants nutrients? Well, if the fertilizer is giving the plants nutrients, the plant no longer needs the fungi, so they shut down their exchange and deny the fungi of their food source. So the fungi no longer are in this relationship and they no longer have a food source from the plant. So as you can see, on the left, there's soil with mycorrhizal fungi, and on the right, there's soil without mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi just provide a lot of transportation throughout the soil because roots only extend so far. The fungi can go all throughout the soil and spread all over and get nutrients from long distances away from the plant and bring them to the plant. So they're almost like a highway or a railroad to the plant's roots. So how does this relate to eating less meat? There are so many relationships and communities of decomposers and microorganisms alive beneath the soil, as you can see in your soil that you just created, because it's not just chocolate pudding. I mean, you put marshmallows and M&Ms and gummy worms in there, and it just becomes much more vibrant and alive and delicious. So think of like the more delicious your soil becomes, the more healthy the soil is in the real life parallel. However, the production of livestock and the production of feed for the livestock breaks these relationships, which weakens the soil. As we said, the production of livestock feed requires a lot of fertilizer because the soil is usually pretty unhealthy since they only grow corn and soy. So farmers use fertilizer to artificially give the plants nutrients, but this damages the relationship between the microorganisms and the plant. Without the relationship, there's not as much fungi in the soil which degrades the soil. And the problem with unhealthy soil, because it doesn't have many microorganisms in it, is that it can't store or sequester, as we said earlier, as much carbon from the atmosphere, and actually it even ends up releasing it. So it does the opposite of what we want. We want carbon sequestration, which is taking carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. But when soil is unhealthy, it actually releases the carbon from the soil into the atmosphere. So what you can do, Including less meat in our diets is a way that we can act to decrease the extensive demands for meat that industrial livestock farms are catering to. Your action is one important step towards rebuilding a more sustainable relationship with meat that is better for us, the livestock, and most importantly, our environment. 
you can eat your microorganisms and decomposers and soil right now if you'd like. I hope you enjoyed that activity. And finally, we're going to play fantastic foods and try to guess what these plant-based foods are. Hopefully learn something new. First one, I'm one of the most nutritious vegetables. I'm high in iron, which is used to build red blood cells that carry oxygen throughout the body to provide energy. I'm very high in chlorophyll and carotenoids, which can help fight disease, improve eyesight, and possibly prevent certain cancers. I grow very well in spring weather when it is cool and rainy. Do you know what I am? You can pause if you need more time to think. I'm spinach. Yes, spinach contains lots of vitamins that are great for your body, and it's a great plant-based food because it's very versatile and can be used in many dishes. I'm grown on a tree, and I'm actually the seed of this tree. I'm from the Middle East, and I'm grown in the Mediterranean climates with hot summers and mild winters. I'm often eaten by myself, either raw or toasted, but I can also be found in many other dishes, such as cookies, in pastries, and in other dishes. I'm a very good source of plant-based protein, and I can even be turned into milk or a kind of butter. What am I? I'm an almond. Almonds can be used in a lot of different ways, especially in plant-based recipes. And one of the most common plant-based milks is actually almond milk. This one belongs to the prunus family, which includes other fruits such as apricots, plums, almonds, and cherries. I'm called a stone fruit because I have a shell of hardwood around my seed, which is called a pit. My skin is usually orange and yellow, but it has tiny hairs called fuzz. I taste very sweet, and I am often used in many desserts, such as cobblers, pies, and pastries. What am I? You've probably heard of this one, and it is a peach. Yes, peaches are one of my favorite fruits. They're great during the summertime, and they're super sweet, and they have lots of vitamins in them as well. That's all for this workshop. I hope you enjoyed making your decomposers in soil and learned some new things about water pollution and using livestock sustainably. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at plantedgoodness at gmail.com or visit my website at plantedgoodness.org um, where you can find more recipes, activities, and learn more about these issues at hand. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye.